The boy and his father have spent the entire morning cleaning out the basement of the boy's grandfather, and the boy is absolutely exhausted. After yet another trip up those rickety cellar steps, the boy collapses onto the old living room couch. He can still hear his father puttering around downstairs, yelping and gasping in surprise every time he finds some memento of his childhood stashed among the debris. The boy sighs in annoyance. He doesn't really know his grandfather, so he doesn't feel any sense of loss as they tear through the boxes and bags in the basement. His father, however, insisted that the boy come along. It'll be good for us to spend some time together, he said, and the boy suspects that his father is trying to deal with his own guilt about his strained relationship with the boy's grandfather. Perhaps he hopes that a day of father-son bonding is just what they need to make sure that they don't grow apart as his father did with his grandfather. The boy, however, doesn't think that cleaning out a musty old basement should qualify as effective father-son bonding. It's super boring. Worse, it turns out that the boy's deceased grandfather was an absolute hoarder who couldn't throw anything away, so the house is filled with all sorts of worthless garbage. The boy groans, his feet ache from traipsing all those stairs, and his back aches from carrying boxes. He thinks that he deserves a little break. He pulls a small handheld gaming console from the pocket of his hoodie and turns it on. I'll just play for a couple minutes, he thinks to himself, then I'll go and help dad some more. He won't mind if I take a short break to recover. The boy is sitting on the battered couch in the living room, playing the latest game on his handheld game console, when his father lurches into the room, carrying a gigantic white plastic box in his arms. Check it out, sport, says his dad, a wide grin on his face. Look what I just found in the basement. The boy briefly looks up from his game, resisting the temptation to roll his eyes at his father's annoying enthusiasm. His father is always getting excited for the dumbest things. As for that white box, the boy's never seen anything like it. It's a Sega Dreamcast, the father says as he sets the white box on the living room floor and starts to untangle the massive wires protruding from the back of the object. This was my favorite video game system when I was a kid. I guess your grandfather just couldn't throw it away. What else is new? mutters the boy under his breath. But he bites his tongue as he watches his father studiously pick apart the knots in the tangled wires. Obviously, this hunk of junk has big sentimental value for his dad. Reluctantly, he slides off the couch and takes a seat next to his father on the floor, and together, the two of them set up the Dreamcast. This had all the best games, continues his father. Soul Calibur, Sega vs. Capcom, oh, you're gonna love these. After a few minutes, his father has the wires plugged into the television, and the hand controller's ready. He nudges his son in the side with his elbow. What do you say, champ? You ready to go mano a mano against your old man with some real video games? I'm about to school you in what real games are like, none of this silly, what's it called, Among Us junk like you played today. It's not called Among Us, Dad, mutters the boy under his breath, but his father is already distracted pulling out old games. His father holds up a CD clamshell and pries it open, revealing a stack of silvery discs. And look at this, all my old games too. The boy tries to contain his boredom as his father rattles off a list of his favorite old video games, none of which are familiar to the boy. But eventually, his father reaches one disc that isn't familiar. Eurythmics, he says, squinting at the title embossed across the disc. I don't remember this one. I wonder if your grandfather got it after I moved out. The father pauses as if overcome with emotion. The boy can imagine what his father is thinking. Did his grandfather buy this disc knowing how much his father loved his Dreamcast video games and hoping that maybe it could serve as a reconciliation present between them? That's exactly the sort of dopey, sentimental thing that his dad would think after spending all morning going through his grandfather's junk and reminiscing about what could have been. Uh, it looks like it's some sort of dance game, prompts the boy, hoping to get his father to focus more on the game than his feelings of nostalgia and loss. Oh, right, right, says the father. I wonder why Grandpa had this when he didn't have a dance mat to connect. Maybe you just have to hit the control buttons in rhythm? Hmm. He holds it up, the reflective disc shining brightly in the light of the overhead lamp and the boy stares at the silvery disc in confusion. He's seen pictures of CD-ROM discs before, in old catalogs or even movies, but he's never seen one in real life. Who even uses discs like that anymore? Everything's just downloadable from the internet these days. What is that anyway? asks the boy. A CD? This is not a CD, says his father, a slight edge of annoyance in his voice. The boy rolls his eyes. His father is always acting like he should be familiar with the outdated dinosaur technology of his father's youth. When will his dad learn? Just because this junk was important to his father when he was growing up doesn't mean that it's still important to the next generation. The boy holds his tongue, knowing that his father will probably start to sulk if he's reminded that time marches on, and that he's no longer as hip and with it as he likes to think he is. It's a GD-ROM, 
says his father, as if those words are supposed to mean anything to the boy. It stands for Gigabyte Disk Read-Only Memory. The boy has no clue what that means, and he hopes that his father isn't about to start a lecture on the different kinds of obsolete video game tech that he's suddenly decided are so vitally important for his son to know about. Luckily, his dad doesn't launch into a long-winded talk. He's too curious about what's on this mysterious disk to bother about that now. The father shoves the disk into the Dreamcast and settles down on the floor, gripping the controller with both hands. He's as excited as a kid in a candy store as he waits for the screen to boot up. The boy can't remember the last time that his father has been so eager for anything. But his excitement is short-lived as the first loading screen boots up. A cheerful, happy melody plays from the Dreamcast's speakers. The game title, Eurythmics, flashes on screen with options for one or two players listed below it. The father clicks over to two players, nodding for his son to pick up the other controller. The boy does as he's told. He can't imagine that this game is going to be any good. How old is it anyway? It's from when his dad was a kid, so that's all the way back in the 90s. This game might as well be a hundred years old for all the boy cares. Immediately when the father chooses two players, the screen starts to glitch. The father yells in frustration, throwing his controller to the floor, but the boy sighs in relief. Thank God, at least now he won't have to pretend that this dinosaur game is anything good. I guess it's busted, says the boy, ready to turn away from the Dreamcast, but his father is insistent. No, no, it's just warming up. Watch, I'll fix this. He grabs his controller and tries to click on two players again. The screen only glitches more. Okay, okay, just give me a minute, says the father. If this doesn't work, I'll just take the disc out and blow on it. I'm sure that'll work. The boy stares in confusion. It's a disc, not a cartridge. He doesn't see any way that blowing on it will have any effect. His father is just desperately grasping at straws, upset that his attempt at father-son bonding is being thwarted. Meanwhile, the cheerful loading screen music starts to fray stuck repeating a single reverberating note that gradually degenerates into a tuneless cacophony. The pixels shimmy and wobble on screen, the image fracturing worse and worse as the father struggles to get the game console to respond to his commands. The boy watches the screen with disinterest at first, but then… wait, what's going on? The more he stares at the screen, the more the random noises and broken graphics seem to form into something strange, something unknowable, but also something vaguely coherent? He blinks in confusion, his jaw dropping. He wants to call his father's attention to the bizarre formations on screen, but his father is too busy wrestling with the controller to notice the effect that he's having. Dad, Dad, look at the screen, says the boy, grabbing his father's shoulder and pointing. Huh, what is it, did it work? What the? The father furrows his brow in confusion as he notices the wildly oscillating image on the TV screen for the first time. That doesn't look like a Dreamcast game at all. It's all broken. I… I think? The colors swirl around the screen in hypnotic, psychedelic patterns, and both father and son find themselves mesmerized, unable to look away. The boy is only vaguely aware of what computer graphics in the late 90s would have looked like, but he's reasonably sure that no underpowered 90s console could produce something this wild. The boy feels himself getting groggy, his brain fogging over as he stares at the wildly oscillating shapes on the screen. He feels like he could almost make sense of them if he just tried hard enough. It's like looking at one of those old-fashioned magic eye pictures, where the image only collapses into sense if you cross your eyes just right, but these strange swirls of color are something far beyond that. The swirls spiral into distinct vortex patterns, to the point that the boy might almost believe that he's looking at… eyes. Yes, that's it, he's sure of it. He wants to panic as he becomes aware of the sensation of being watched. He feels like something beyond the screen, some malevolent entity, has somehow gained access to his world via this video game and is now watching him, sizing him up like a predator would size up its prey. He can't think of anything except those staring eyes with their rotating pupils. He wants to fall forward and disappear into the eternal nothingness of those awful eyes. Next to him, his father is silent. Like the boy, he's also enraptured by the infinite eyes on screen. Oh my god, he mutters, so quiet that the boy can barely hear him. Do you… do you see the eyes? It's your grandfather. He's watching us. From… beyond. I know that's him. The boy doesn't know whether his father is right. His father is probably just letting his guilt color his perception, because the boy doesn't feel like there's human intelligence on the other side of the screen. Whatever is out there, whether it's an alien mind from beyond human ken, or simply a computer program given awful sentience by a freak accident, it's not something that the boy can even begin to comprehend. 
He feels his mind shutting down in the face of that terror, as if his brain simply cannot take the strain anymore. He's only vaguely aware of his father hitting the floor in a dead faint. That should worry him. He should be frightened. He should want to rush to his father's side and try to shake him back awake. But his brain can't make his body respond. He feels his arms and legs getting weak and his eyelids getting heavy. It isn't long before his eyes drift shut and the boy collapses onto the floor next to his father. Hours later, after the sun has already set, a car pulls up in front of the house and the boy's mother gets out. She frowns as she looks at the front of the house, noting that the lights are on inside and the front bay window casts a yellow square of light across the front lawn. The boy and his father must still be inside. They were supposed to have finished moving all that junk hours ago. She's tried calling both of their cell phones to remind them that they should be home for dinner, but neither father nor son has answered any of her calls or texts. She's not worried though. They often ignore their phones when they get really involved in an activity, and she suspects, rightly, that her husband probably found some childhood relic in the basement that's distracted him from getting the task done. She's willing to bet that the two of them probably haven't even finished cleaning the basement. She walks up the garden path and puts her hand against the doorknob. The door creaks open. She frowns. Nothing sinister about that, right? Of course, they wouldn't bother to lock the door if they were still working inside, right? Nevertheless, she feels a strange chill run up her spine. Why is she suddenly so nervous? She pushes open the door and fumbles for the light switch. The foyer is dark, as is most of the house. The only light comes from the living room, and she can see that something within is throwing dancing shadows against the far wall. She hears a toneless, mechanical drone emanating from the living room. Are they watching television? That would be just like them to turn on the tube and completely lose track of time. But what TV show would make an awful din like that? She storms into the living room, ready to read her husband and son the riot act. But then, she stops dead in her tracks. Her husband and son are here all right, but they're lying in crumpled heaps upon the floor, staring glassy-eyed at the ceiling. She screams as she rushes to her husband, praying that she's wrong, that they're just playing a prank on her, that they just got tired and lay down on the floor to rest. But as she presses her finger against his wrist, she feels that he's cold and lifeless. He's dead, and has been for hours. Her son, pale and cold and lifeless, lies next to him. She looks up, her gaze connecting with the television screen. It continues to flash vacillating images in an erratic loop, nonsense static that she can't understand. But if she didn't know better, she might almost feel like it's watching her. The strange, swirling eyes stare back, unblinking and eternal. What started as a misguided attempt at father-son bonding time ended in tragedy, because those GD-ROM discs weren't ordinary discs at all, but rather instances of what the SCP Foundation has dubbed SCP-4904. SCP-4904 is a set of seven modified GD-ROM discs manufactured by the Sega Corporation. SCP Foundation agents have been able to pinpoint the date of manufacture of each disc sometime between 1997 and 1999. The GD-ROM was a proprietary format originally used for the Dreamcast video game console, developed by Yamaha as an answer to fighting the piracy that was rampant among more standard compact discs and to offer increased storage capacity without the expense of the fledgling DVD-ROM. The GD-ROM seemed promising at the time, as it had a storage capacity of a full gigabyte, 42% higher than conventional CDs. Ultimately though, GD-ROMs failed to catch on and were quickly outpaced by DVD technology. The seven discs in the SCP Foundation storage are visually indistinguishable from non-anomalous GD-ROM discs, except for their serial numbers. The serial numbers give some indication of the mystery behind their origin, revealing that they were created by Sega's enigmatic R&D Zero division during the height of the 90s console wars. It is estimated that R&D Zero produced a total of between 60 and 100 experimental GD-ROM discs similar to those in SCP-4904, but the rest of the production line is currently unaccounted for. Each SCP-4904 GD-ROM contains one Sega video game, including Sonic Adventure, Sega Rally Championship 2, House of the Dead 2, Sega Bass Fishing, Godzilla Generations, Virtua Fighter 3 TB, and an unreleased 3D rhythm game by the name of Eurythmics. But the result when anyone tries to play any of these different games is always the same. When an instance of SCP-4904 is fed into a Dreamcast console, it causes the optical disk drive's reader to move in unpredictable ways, accessing disk data seemingly at random. At first, the game boots up as expected and seems perfectly ordinary, 
but when a player progresses past the loading screen, the game very quickly becomes illegible. Sprites and assets blend into each other in asymmetrical chunks, maps recursively render onto other maps, and soundtracks transform within seconds into incessant, oscillating noise. A perfunctory glance at the result seems like absolute chaos, but eventually, observers will start to notice patterns within the noise. These eventually coalesce into complex renderings of landscapes and figures wildly inconsistent with the content of the original games, and computationally impossible for 1990s-era video game hardware to render. Repeated tests by SCP Foundation agents have turned up a recurring motif in the images shown by SCP-4904, spinning disks that resemble malevolent eyes. SCP agents hope that research into R&D Zero and the man responsible for the disk's creation might help to explain the reason or the purpose of SCP-4904. R&D Zero's former lead hardware programmer Ken Matsuya has said on record that the team encountered numerous problems in implementing the disk's anti-piracy encryption measures. The result was unplayable. Frustrated by this failure, Sega ordered that the encryption project be abandoned and the prototype disks quietly destroyed. However, it does not appear that Sega's orders were carried out to the letter. Matsuya himself rescued seven of the disks, hoping to learn more about the issue on his own time, and it's possible that other disks not currently known to the Foundation also survived. With the help of improvised Sega hardware, Matsuya spent the next four years trying to understand the cause behind the disk's erratic behavior. Notebooks recovered from his apartment contain numerous sketches of the disk-generated visuals. Depicting fractal combinations of landscape and figures seemingly drawn from places outside of the game data themselves, and stylized spinning disks in the shape of eyes. Matsuya himself met a strange and untimely end when he was found dead from a heart attack in his apartment in August 2003. Stranger still, an autopsy revealed that large portions of his brainstem and limbic system were missing. His death puzzled authorities, since there was no evidence of any human, or even non-human, intrusion. Matsuya had apparently loaded one of the SCP-4904 instances in his possession into his home Dreamcast before his death, because the distinctive psychedelic visuals were playing on his television screen at the time that his body was discovered. Foundation agents suspected that the visuals might have some connection with Matsuya's death, leading to the disc's subsequent classification and containment, but intensive tests on SCP-4904 by Foundation personnel have failed to shed any light on the situation. Both the disc's strange behavior and Matsuya's death remain complete mysteries. Is SCP-4904 a gateway into some other dimension, and its bizarre images a signal from another world? Could it be a message from beyond the veil? Or is it all just due to a simple computer glitch and Matsuya's death just a freak coincidence? Whatever the case, the Foundation is doing its best to uncover the truth. SCP-4904 has been given the object class safe, but should be stored in conditions comparable to those needed to keep non-anomalous disks viable. All seven instances of SCP-4904 are kept in a climate-controlled safe class storage locker at Site-15. Long-term tests lasting over an hour should only be conducted on reinforced, modified hardware to prevent disk deformation or explosion. If you want to support our important mission while also getting influence over the anomalies we cover and an exclusive look behind the scenes, check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-674, The Exposition Gun Makes Nintendo Real Life, for another nightmarish twist on a nostalgic piece of gaming hardware. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.